Good morning. So my name is Elizabeth Giffen, and I'm actually presenting today on Camifera momol, um, which is also more commonly known as myrrh. Uh, myrrh is in the uh, Berseraceae family. And so just to give us um, a quick overview of some of the things we'll be discussing uh, regarding myrrh. Um, so myrrh grows in arid alpine habitats in North Africa. Um, you can use it as a gum, a resin, or as an essential oil. Um, we're all pretty familiar with myrrh because of its religious uses, so especially now that it's sort of the Christmas season. Um, it's been used for a very, very long time as incense and perfume. Um, but it also has a staggering range of medicinal usage since, since we started writing down you know, traditional remedies. Um, so, and one of the important chemicals responsible for myrrh's smell, um, which is sort of a warm, uh, like a smoky, musky sort of scent, is um, lindestrine, which is a furanosesca terpene, which actually makes up about 19% of myrrh's essential oil. So it's um, a pretty big component. So just a quick botanical description of myrrh. Um, it's actually a pretty easily spotted plant. It's a sort of small, uh, it's very spiny, um, and like its habitat, arid and alpine, it has sort of sparse foliage. Um, and the bark actually peels. The bark is silvery with um, a sort of shiny green underlayer, um, which you can sort of see here, but not quite as well. Um, it, is, it grows wild in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Oman, and Yemen. Um, and the way that the, uh, the usable material is harvested is actually by making about two inch incisions into the bark. Um, and then, so the, it's sort of like, they call it tapping, so it's sort of like getting the maple syrup out of a maple tree. You know, it just sort of beads out and it dries when it hits the air and it comes off in these little sort of pebbles that are um, easily collected and then that's done at certain times of the year when the tree is healthy, um, and they can be reopened pretty easily. So it's pretty sustainable. <coughs> um, so there are many traditional uses uh, for myrrh. And as I mentioned, um, it is extremely prominent in uh, biblical literature. Um, it's best known as one of the gifts of the Magi to the Christ child in the Nativity. Um, so it was also actually mentioned in the Song of Solomon. Um, was a bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. So myrrh was actually extremely, extremely valuable in that time period on the level of ivory and gold and things like that. Um, it was also offered as a last gift to Jesus when he was on the cross. So it was mingled with wine. Um, it was purportedly an analgesic. He didn't take it, so I guess we can't know. Um, and then it was also brought to him um, for embalming his body after death with aloes. So... Um, and it's actually one of the oldest plant-based therapies on record. Um, so our first evidence of the use of myrrh, the trade of myrrh, actually comes from a fresco on a temple just outside of Thebes, um, which depicts the sort of Queen Hatshepsut sending off the League of Egyptians to the land of Punt. Um, and it details them coming back with incense-bearing trees and nitiwa, nitiwa. There are no vowels in Egyptian. So that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a little bit rough. Um, but it's believed to translate to myrrh, if not frankincense. But the general consensus is, is leaning more towards myrrh. Um, so uh, one of the earliest uh, records we have of myrrh's use as medicinal therapy is in the Ebers papyrus, um, which is from around circa 1550 BCE. So pretty old. Um, it lists it as an incense, um, but also for use in funerals, mummifications, and cremations. Um, and it's also used as a treatment for wounds and skin sores. And there's actually stories that you know Greeks wouldn't go into battle without myrrh, um, just to have on them, you know, to treat wounds, to help clean wounds, and things like that. Um, so we see it also in um, the Mesopotamian cuneiform text, the Syriac Book of Medicine, which is anonymous, um, Avicenna's works, Hippocrates' works. Um, it's mentioned as sort of secondhand as being said to uh, things by uh, Aristotle. It's mentioned really extensively in both Celsus de Medicina and Dioscorides de, Medi de Materia Medi Medica um, to treat everything from uh, forms of malaria, tuberculosis, dropsy, poison antidote, um, all sorts of swellings, uh, inflammations, to clean wounds, to heal wounds as an ointment to treat 
chest pain, liver pain, side pain, ear pain, throat pain. If you have any abscesses or ulcers, pretty, uh, pretty widely used. And then, of course, in the um, tra Chinese traditional medicine, um, it's mentioned in the Kaibao Bin Kao. Um, and it's actually still used today to treat um, traumatic injuries, circulation, um, and inflammations and things like that. So a very, very well-used plant. So some of the chemistry and pharmacology of myrrh. Um, so when you tap the myrrh, what comes out is about 2 to 8 percent uh, essential oil or volatile oil, 40 percent rosin, and 40 to 60 percent gum. Um, and so the gum component is actually water soluble. Um, it contains, of course, a lot of polysaccharides, proteoglycans, proteins, D-galactose, L-arabinose, 4-methyl-D-glucuronic acid. Um, the essential oil you can actually um, get out of the raw product by steam distillation. Um, it contains steroids, sterols, and terpenes, including furanosesquiterpenes, terpenoids, excuse me. Um, and so that is, of course, um, where we find the lindestrine, which gives the smell, as well as um, close to 20 furanosesquiterpenoids that have been isolated from the essential oil. Um, so finally, we have the resin, which contains acetates, acetyl beta udesmol, uh, sesquiterpene, lactones, terpenoids, flavonoids, lignans, um, and then the long chain aliphatic alcohol derivatives. And so these are just a few of the myrrh marker compounds, um, which I will not attempt to explain <laughs> or read. But um, when uh, scientists are testing the veracity of a sample of myrrh, these are some compounds they can look for in order to determine that the myrrh is actually myrrh, or the myrrh that they're looking for. Rather. Um, so some of the biological activities of myrrh um, so a, an extraction in ethanol and petroleum ether, two different ones, of, of Camifera myrrha, which is another name for the same plant, Camifera momol, um, reduced the paw swelling um, in mice when they were given um, acetic acid. Um, and they also, they, they look at writhing as a test of pain, so it reduced a lot of the writhing. Um, so they didn't actually see any attenuation of the um, temperature-dependent nociception, which is where they put them on a, a sort of like toasty little plate and see how fast they like start to, you know, uh, usually it's paw licking to, you know, show how quickly they react to the pain of heat. Um, so they didn't actually see a change in this, which um, suggests that the analgesic myrrh extracts, um, or at least the ones shown um, in this extraction, act on peripheral and not central nociceptive pathways, which have to do more with um, things that non-temperature-induced pain. So um, Ferrano Udesma 1,3-diene um, has actually shown a lot of activity, as well as curzarine, which you get from extracting myrrh with a nonpolar extraction like hexanes was the example used. Um, so they are actually found to have temperature-dependent analgesic activity. Um, so if you, if you give it in the brain. Um, so what that means is that um, if you put the mice on a hot plate, you will see them um, start to lick their paws and some reaction more slowly. So it's a slower reaction, um, which is how that's measured. And so the same chemical um, given orally, actually, um, will attenuate response to both measures of pain. So it definitely has some kind of activity as an analgesic, but we need a little bit more research. Um, and as you can see in clinical studies, there have been several done, but um, I made a note on here because I realized as I was doing the research for this that there are really not any studies that I could find um, in the U.S. on myrrh. So that's one area we could maybe work on a little bit um, if we're going into maybe looking at uh, using myrrh uh, medicinally here. But in Egypt, actually, um, a study was done uh, with myrrh extract to treat um, fasciolysis and schistosomal infections, um, which was incredibly, extremely effective, but unfortunately, uh, in following studies, was not able to be replicated, wasn't shown to have any um, effect. So it's pretty unclear as to whether those were fabricated or not. So um, as, as more studies are done on this, uh, it'll clear that up. But it would be great um, because Myrrh in this uh, study was shown to cure these diseases within six days. So, um, In India, a study was done with an herbal toothpaste that contains myrrh that showed that it had the same activity as a, a normal conventional toothpaste, 
but it didn't have any you know, sort of extra benefits or anything like that. Um, in China, they did a study on uh, various TCM remedies, including uh, one that contained a lot of myrrh, um, which did decrease pain and swelling and reflexive sympath reflex sympathetic dy dystrophy. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, in Israel, a study was done on um, a very old recipe for Jerusalem balsam, which was actually quite popular several centuries ago, um, which contains myrrh, um, and it was shown to be actually very strongly antiseptic. Um, so some of the contraindications for myrrh, um, the FDA does approve it as a flavoring substance, um, but since it was mentioned in ancient texts, Dioscurides, Celsus, etc., as being in an abortive fashion and in a minagogue, it's not exactly recommended for pregnant women. Not enough studies have been done to show whether or not it is, in fact, uh, an abortive fashion or a minagogue, but to be on the safe side, it's not recommended for use by pregnant women. Um, for those with sensitive skin, um, a high enough concentration can actually give people contact dermatitis. So um, when using myrrh ointments, it's good to know just to do a spot test or something before you, you start you know, rubbing it all over yourself for pain relief or whatever. Um, and the LD50 um, of myrrh, which is the lethal dose for 50% um, of whatever you give it to, in this case rats, um, of myrrh essential oil is um, uh, 1,650 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so um, myrrh can actually be taken in internally in small quantities, but uh, at a high enough dose, it does give people stomach problems, so it's usually recommended as an external topical um, application. So for current use, um, we actually see a lot, a lot of use of myrrh um, as a medicinal uh, therapy in China. Uh, because of Chinese judicial medicine still being very, very popular and common there. Um, we also see, uh, there was a study done in Saudi Arabia actually looking at percent of people who use uh, uh, alternative treatments to treat um, foot disorders and foot problems in diabetics in a town there. Um, and a great deal of them actually used myrrh containing products. Um, Toms of Maine, which is a sort of um, an herbal, um, uh, US-based uh, store offers myrrh toothpaste um, and then homeopathic treatments um, containing myrrh by the company uh, Frankincense and Myrrh um, are offered to treat neuropathy, fibromyalgia, cold and flu prevention, and actually even sinus relief. So, so finally, myrrh has been very useful for a very long time. Um, it is generally regarded as safe, but again, not enough research has really been done in my opinion, so I would caution people before they go out and start taking this um, in all sorts of different things. Um, so more research, when I say more research needs to be done, it also needs to be very thorough and very controlled research because as we've seen with some of the clinical studies, um, there's a little bit of unsurety as to whether some of the studies being done um, how controlled and how, how much veracity they actually have. Um, and definitely I would love to see more research done in the US. 